Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm very nervous. I'm excited to be here. Uh, the weather is storming. It's pretty amazing, and uh, you know, happy to see so many people. So I know that some of you have been to some of my earlier talks. So I don't need to go too uh, heavily into this introduction, but uh, you know, just to give you a feeling of how I think about myself. I think about myself professionally as a platforms guy, right? So I just all the time think about platforms. So, you know, why is the platform concept so interesting? So to me, a platform is like a launching pad for any endeavor. So whether you're launching your business or launching your startup, launching your career, whatever it may be, that's all being done on a platform, right? And I think the question that I want to answer today, the puzzle that I'm thinking about today is what makes a platform take off? Because in a way, programmers, developers are gamblers. So if you think about the roulette wheel, right? You put your chips somewhere. Right Now, you might want to put your chips on something kind of safe. So if you say, I want to go red or I want to go black, you know, you pick something really big, like, okay, Microsoft's pretty big, I'm just going to put my chips on black. Right? But in a way, when you make a safe bet, then if it hits, you don't get as big of a payout. But if you make a bet that's really kind of edgy, maybe a bigger return comes, right? So what I want to do is help you guys think about what makes a platform an interesting investment. And the reason I think developers are investors is that they invest their time and energy and passion into learning platforms, right? So you have to kind of think like, hey, is this worth my investment or not? So that's a real important question. And when do you know when you've reached the end of a certain relationship and when you need to kind of go to the next platform. So I've done a little bit of platform hopping in my career. So you know, professionally I've gone kind of through this core Java origin space, you know, up through web services and enterprise web services, and I'm now kind of into mobile stuff. So you know, this this is really a, kind of a real interesting thing that's shaped the way I think about my career. So this is just a quick hit of what I'm doing now. I'm going to hit this on the tail end of my talk as well. For those of you who don't like talks and who like typing, you know, you can go to key.com or developer.key.com. You can get direct experience of what I'm working on. Uh, I don't mind if you're typing away or doing your email while I talk. It's, it's fine. Um, but this is, this is the tail end of my talk. My agenda today is threefold. First of all, I wanted to just tell the story of my Java journey. Uh, you know, I, I was talking with Dilip about my session, and you know, in a way, one of the things that's fun to experience is just thinking about how Java was born, you know, and what makes this platform move so rapidly into adoption, you know, from zero to five million and beyond uh, for developers. So that, that's part of my agenda today. Uh, I'm hoping that part will be interesting and entertaining. I want to talk about platforms in general. And then I want to share a little bit on the tail end about key, which is what I'm up to now. So you know, in terms of uh, the evolution of Java, like the thing I want to make sure we're set on is I don't want to make big predictions. Uh, and the reason I don't want to make big predictions is, is I really want you guys to have the ability to judge for yourself you know, what's going to happen. So I'm not going to place chips for you. Uh, so let's begin with this, which is sort of my Java journey. I want to characterize this tale, because it's a story. And it's a personal story. Uh, I, you know, 
I want to make sure that the flavor of the story is conveyed in the right spirit, which is uh, I don't consider myself to be a special person. I consider myself to be a very lucky person. I think, you know, if anything, one of the things that I uh, kind of got out of this experience is just understanding how these platforms form just by being near the people that made it happen. So, you know, I, I consider all of what happened in this story to be my good fortune. Uh, so I'm hoping that I can share that with you and give you a little bit of perspective. So it all started in Wisconsin. Uh, this this, uh, this slide doesn't show the right, the word that cuts off at the end here, but it's future computer nerd. So I don't know if you can see this little guy here, but that's, that's me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I'm kind of wondering what's next for... Uh, you know, my, my, so at that time, uh, I hadn't really thought about computers or much of anything. But, you know, I, I was kind of a B, A, or B student. I wasn't particularly a good student either. And one of the things I always had trouble with is, you know, I kind of rebelled against my teachers. So I, I didn't get the best grades. Uh, but, it, you know, since it made my parents angry, I tried to get good grades. So I was stuck in the middle. I was like a B student, something like that, uh, until this box showed up. So this, uh, you know, this is kind of in my early teenage years. I got this thing, which is the uh, Atari 400. So this computer is just this amazing thing. It was back in the days of 8-bit computing. Uh, this device had about 16K of RAM which is pretty fun. And, uh, you know, it's, it, this is really like way back in the, the, the competitive computer at the time was the Apple, uh, Apple II. So one of the cool things is, is that there are probably a dozen people in the room old enough to remember this stuff, <laughs> showing my age. So this is kind of what the programming IDE looked like at the time. And uh, you know, a lot of what I got started in was just the basic programming language, and uh, you know, pretty soon it was a gateway into assembly language. So I started playing with like 8-bit assembly language and this kind of stuff. And you know, it was really fun because ultimately you could build software programs that you know could do really interesting things. Like uh, you know, I, I developed some like binary search machine learning algorithms using self-modifying code. So I found a kind of weird loophole in the basic interpreter where you could actually write code that uh, is written by the machine itself. So, so I went through this very strange loophole to create this kind of self-learning system. It was pretty primitive because you know all it would do is kind of play 20 questions and it, you could kind of guess. It was trying to guess an animal. And then if it failed, you could teach it the question that would separate that animal from the animals that it guessed. Is it, anyhow, to make a long story short, I kind of was a, a junior computer nerd at the time. So I was pretty obsessed with like machine learning and this kind of stuff. So you know, to make a quantum leap, I ended up hanging out at, at this place, uh, Yale University, uh, in a PhD program in uh, basically studying abstract neural networks. So I kind of got involved in sort of doing a lot of intensive C++ programming, uh, trying to figure out basically how does the brain work, but in an abstract pattern, trying to understand learning networks and connectionist systems. So this is kind of my geeking trip. But it all kind of came to a crashing halt. Uh, you know, I was talking to uh, a guy who I really, really respected, uh, my, who would have been my thesis advisor. And he, he said to me one day, he pulled me aside, and he said, why, why are you doing this? So I, I, I was like, well, what do you mean? So he said, why, why, why do you want to be a PhD? And you know, I said, well, it's, it's super interesting. You get to like, do all these great things. You get to think all the time. And you, know, you get to write software all the time. And people pay you. And you know, it's a really secure job. And you know, he said, it isn't any of those things. 
it's a nightmare. <laughs> and his advice, as an advisor, he advised me to essentially get the hell out <laughs> before it was too late. Uh, this is a deep shock to me. Uh, and in fact, it, it awoke in me kind of this questioning. And it kind of rocked my world. Because up to that point, my father was an academic. My mother was a librarian, academic librarian. My brother was on his way to his getting his PhD. So you know, everything was shattered for me. Because if I wasn't going to be a PhD, then I had no idea what was next. So uh, I eventually uh, kind of left this program. Because I figured out that, in fact, very few of the professors there were actually happy human beings. So sure enough, it kind of turned out to be true. So uh, you know, I, I kind of ejected myself. So I spent actually a few years teaching. So I jumped out of this technology, and I jumped into this teaching. So I started teaching high school, and uh, you know, I, I developed a computer curriculum at the school, started teaching. Uh, during the summers, I would teach kind of C++ classes for the advanced kids. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the parents at this school in, in Northern California, I just managed to escape to California during this time, uh, basically said, hey, my, I'm an investment banker, and I want my kids to learn programming from, you know, someone. So why don't you teach them? So I ended up, you know, in sitting in an investment bank, teaching eighth graders how to program in C++, uh, which was kind of interesting. Uh, and, but ultimately, I kind of felt like Luke Skywalker stuck on Tatooine, which is, you know, I felt kind of like trapped by my circumstances. Because, you know, my great idea of becoming a neuroscientist had kind of petered out. You know, I kind of hit my head against really hard programming challenges. But you know, ultimately, I felt a little bit limited by my profession. So basically, this, this is what signified what I called my first call to adventure, which is I happen to be wearing a pair of these. So these are purple Doc Martens shoes. And uh, you know this automatically like labels you as a strange person. Uh, and I was riding in an elevator to get to this investment bank, and there was a guy riding in the elevator with me. And I noticed that the first thing he did was he looked at my shoes. And then I noticed that he something clicked, and he decided he was going to talk to me. I think it was because of the shoes. And he said, "Hey, so what are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, I, I'm a C++." teacher. And so this guy said, well, look, I'm starting a division of Wired magazine called Hot Wired. And we're just going to do this internet thing. We're going to build internet software. And why don't you come over and join my company? <laughs> he said, I'm actually talking to the investment banker about giving me some money to start this venture. So this is random. And this guy's offering me a job based on the color of my shoes. <laughs> but I was like, great. <laughs> very strange. And, and again, like this is very weird, because it's a tunnel. It's like this weird set of coincidences and tunnels. So, so I, I followed this tunnel. And I ended up working at this strange place on, on third Avenue in downtown kind of San Francisco. And if you actually look at it, this place, it's like this warehouse. And when you climb up the stairs, the first floor is basically uh, you know, just a machine shop. And then you go to the second floor, and you see all these like Asian women, and they're sewing. They're all busily making kind of garments in this huge warehouse building. And then you go up to the third floor, and there we were. And it was a bunch of like crazy purple shoe wearing hacker type people, like all, all sitting there. And it was almost like the same as the sewing. They were all like banging away on their computers. And this was uh, hotwired, very strange environment. But 
you know, if you actually went up one more floor, so there's a total of four floors. So if you have one, one more floor, there's actually a company called Organic Online. Now, Organic Online is not that famous, but there was one guy there who ended up being a little bit unusual and famous. Uh, this guy, uh, Brian Bellendorf. And he, it was very interesting because he, I actually ended up kind of like hanging out with him because he was a big time raver. So his thing was going to like all these crazy parties and dancing all night long. And so I kind of befriended him. But the thing that was really cool is, is he had two PCs. He had the PC that he would do his work on under his desk. And there was this other PC sitting under his desk, which was this thing called Apache.org, right? And at the time, like, the Apache web server and the domain and everything was all sitting under his desk. So, like, at the time, it was like you could basically kick over all of Apache just by like, doing this, <laughs> you know? So, so it was just a really strange time and just so much happening just in South San Francisco at the time. Now, it's all mobile startups. So I don't know what it is about South San Francisco, but it's a, it's a weird place to hang out. So while I was at this place, Hotwired, you know, I basically just started monkeying around, and I ran across this thing, which is like Java and Hot Java. So I don't know if you guys remember the Hot Java browser, but it was a Java browser. It was written in Java, and it was a browser. And the thing that was unique about Hot Java at the time was that it could run Java applets, which was kind of cool. This was before Netscape could run applets, and this was before anyone else could run applets. So it was a unique experience for me. And I had this kind of like thing of like, wow, like, hey, these web pages can do more than just be pieces of paper. They could actually run software right there. This is a novel idea. And that idea has kind of expanded into HTML5 applications and the whole universe of, you know, even these crazy, like, 2D game, 3D game stuff happening in HTML5 now, right? So that idea has kind of, like, expanded vastly since that time. But I remember writing this thing and I, having this experience of Java, and it was just kind of amazing, which is I was sitting there, it was like this three in the morning experience, and I was writing, so I was basically writing some stuff that was sort of like, WebSocket stuff today. This is basically how can you maintain session, real-time session across multiple browsers? Because it was a really interesting problem. Because obviously, like HTTP was kind of like async, and it just you know it, you couldn't do these kind of like simultaneous animation type things using that protocol without doing a bunch of tricks, right? And so I compiled this applet, you know, and and I was at the time collaborating with Wired Japan to build a whole bunch of applets in Hot Java. And I did a compilation, and you know, I looked at the binary result, and it was. Uh, it turned out that it was exactly 14k in size. And I just had this crazy thing because it was three in the morning, and you know, I was drinking lots of coffee and programming away, and there it was. And you know, the last time I hit this kind of 14k size was back in like Atari 400 land, right? So I just had this crazy like enlightenment feeling of like, wow, this is amazing. This is revolutionary. So this event is actually a really important event, which is that every platform needs to have an enlightenment experience for developers. So one of the clues that you have a successful platform is, is that you can actually have this kind of enlightenment experience. I mean, for example, like in Ruby, like just going into a web page and watching being able to use a Ruby compiler embedded in a web page, that's kind of cool. Uh, you know, for Node.js, it's this uh, Hello World program where you're actually building a web server. And it's like, wow, this is really bending my head. I'm building a web server in Node.js. Like, that's pretty cool, right? So every platform has its own kind of enlightenment experience. So I think the enlightenment experience is really important. And so for me, this is kind of the second call to adventure. Uh, which is, you know, in, in the Matrix movie, there's this moment where he's sitting in front of his computer and this kind of weird typing appears. You know, the Matrix has you follow the white rabbit, right? So 
what's the white rabbit in my case? So in my case, the white rabbit was this thing, which is uh, Sun Microsystems was having this set of Java days. So Java day was like just these big parties for, for people to learn about Java. So I called them up. And you know, I said, hey, I'm, I want to come to Java Day. And so they said, OK, well, but it's too bad, because the Java Day you want to go to and all the other ones are sold out, so there's no way to come. And the weirdest thing happened. I was talking to them on the phone, and all of a sudden I blurted out, I want to present. Right? And this hadn't been anything I thought of at the moment, but it was just this weird, like, I have to be there, and this is the only way I can get in. And so they said, well, who are you? I said, well, I, I'm working with Wired, and I'm building Java cool stuff. And they were like, great. Come on over. You can demo your cool stuff. It'll be fun. So this was kind of the thing that another skinny tunnel into this crazy world. So my world kind of opened up yet again. So this is like the Ultra Spark launch. And what Sun Microsystems did is they got the tent from Cirque du Soleil, and they put it onto the Sun campus. And they stuck all these kind of Sun Microsystems developers in a room. And uh, you know, I got to kind of like talk to them about Java. And you know, at the time, I was so excited about it that you know, it was kind of infectious. So people were very excited. So I ended up going to the second Java day, which was uh, you know, in New York. This was in Silicon Valley. My theme here was I, I talked about the revolution will not be televised. And I had a completely separate theme in New York, which uh, was a different one. So this is kind of a, a funny, this is a funny event for me, which is, uh, you know, I was about to go on and show my demos. Uh, and this, they were all pre-cached on the nice Spark server sitting there, you know, uh, on stage. And these crazy guys from this company called Dimension X. So Dimension X was basically a bunch of guys who had figured out how to hack 3D stuff in Java. So they were doing all these crazy 3D demos in Java, and it was like super hardcore, and they were using like Java native interface, and they were using all this kind of hardcore underlying graphics card technology or whatever. So what happened was, was that they were running their demo. This is before me. And the they crashed the sunbox. They sent the sunbox into a kernel panic and the whole thing shut down, which is pretty awesome. And of course, you know, I was trying not to panic myself. Um, but what was cool was, was that there's this great kind of like loaded across the network. But here's the problem. The problem was is that my code was actually not sitting in the wired offices. It was actually sitting in Japan, right? So I had this kind of load across the network from New York to Japan problem, which was kind of crazy. Uh, so I ended up giving my talk. So I had this entire talk set. And the whole time I was talking, like at the beginning of the talk, I clicked the web page. And I said, OK, go. And then I started talking. And at the kind of very end of my time to talk, they hadn't even loaded yet, which is kind of like really a bummer. Uh, you know, and, and the head of marketing for Java at the time, um, Kim Palese, she was doing the MC for this. She basically was like practically grabbing my arm <laughs> to take me off the stage. And so I turned to the audience and I was like, don't you guys want to wait just five more seconds to see this stuff? So everyone cheered. Everyone was like, yeah. And I, it was so totally awesome. And at that exact moment, they all loaded and it was like this cool wired demo thing. And everyone was like, yay. So that was like really great. Great moment for me. And thank heaven for 14K, right? I mean, this very, these are very small applets, right? So that was saved. And this is when I knew that Java was going to happen. And it was going to happen big. So this guy, uh, this, guy this is Arthur Van Hoff, uh, awesome, crazy Dutch guy. Uh, he wrote most of Hot Java. He wrote the first version of the Java C compiler. He wrote this monstrosity called AWT, the Abstract Window Toolkit. Uh, he, he wrote a bunch of stuff. He's like super productive and super smart guy. Uh, he ended up grabbing a bunch of 
job of people and forming a company called Marimba at the time. But anyhow, really cool guy. Uh, I was hanging out with him in the lobby of a conference much like this. It was one of the Java days. And this guy runs up to him with the program and says, you're Arthur Van Hoff. He said, yes. And then he said, can I have your autograph? Right. And this is so amazing to me because it's like, this guy is like a rock star, you know, like he's like this amazing, you know, godlike figure. And the thing about it is when you look in the kind of like Java docs, you know, his, his signature is everywhere because he's written all this stuff. But it was just a really amazing clue of like, hey, something magical is happening here. So that was kind of when I joined this crazy gang. So this is kind of the original Java team. This, this couple of folks, uh, Patrick, Patrick Naughton was actually a hockey playing buddy of Scott McNeely, the CEO of Sun. So he kind of ferreted away some money. And one of the reasons why he got the money was, was he told the CEO, I'm sick of working at Sun. And you know, the CEO of Sun was like, well, you're my hockey buddy, so you have to stay. What do you want? And so basically he said, I want to have a Skunk Works project sitting in a VC incubator on Sand Hill Road, which turned out to be these guys. So, you know, folks, folks you might recognize. So, you know, I mentioned Arthur Van Hoff. That's this guy here, uh, Herb Jelinek, Tim Lindholm. He wrote the, the uh, JVM. So, and he, he wrote the JVM for a long time. So he, he really scaled uh, Lisa Friendly. This guy is James Gosling, who is the sort of godfather of it all, and amazing guru of Java. This is Kim. She, uh, you know, named Java and effectively was the marketing arm for Java. Uh, you know, it's it's funny actually. These these folks, Kim, and Arthur, and Sammy, and Jonathan, they all left to form this company called Marimba uh, at some point, and that was kind of a big disruption. But I got to meet up with these cats and feel the energy, and you know I was hooked. So I was definitely in. So this is what I call write once, run everywhere, which is in this phase. Uh, what happened was, was you know I kind of stopped writing software at some level. I started just running everywhere, and uh, you know I ran uh, all around the world at these different conferences, uh, effectively just evangelizing this stuff, because that was really what was most exciting to me, was just sharing this amazing thing that had happened to me, the enlightenment experience of Java. So this is like about 80,000 developers in different contexts. Uh, you know, there's me hanging out in Singapore. I, I'm, I'm this guy. So back in these days, I had like a lot more hair. <laughs> Today, I have no hair. <laughs> so there's the hair again. So that's me in, in Manila. So this is actually a really fun trip because I ended up hanging out with uh, Eric Schmidt, who was sort of the executive sponsor of Java. So if you looked at the, the organization inside of Sun, Eric Schmidt was the CTO of Sun. And under him, you know, there was the whole Java products group at the time which would eventually become JavaSoft. Uh, and this is very interesting because, uh, you know, Asian people generally enjoy singing. Uh, in particular, I noticed that people in the Philippines like to sing. In fact, the average level of skill is much higher than the average level of skill in the United States. And so we were in, in the Philippines all together and after dinner, people were feeling pretty good, and so each of these different national groups of people started singing the songs that came from their country. So the Filipino people would sing their national songs and all this stuff. And I just remember this is a crazy moment for me because uh, you know people in the United States generally don't like singing very much, but it was really fun because uh, you know. Basically, we ended up singing this song, America the Beautiful, but I just remember the look on uh, Eric Schmidt's face because he was singing along, but uh, you know, very kind of self-conscious and embarrassed. But uh, you know, interesting, uh, interesting times, interesting people. 
Uh, so I never met the guy on the left, but I did get a chance to hang out with the guy on the right. So the guy on the left, obviously, is Bill Gates. The guy on the right is Andy Grove, who was, at the time, CEO of Intel. And um, one day, Eric Schmidt was like, we need to show Intel the Java thing. And so he grabbed, he rounded up a bunch of like folks, and he said, let's go show them. So we went into his executive staff meeting, and we kind of demoed. I did some demos of Java stuff. And you know, at the time, I was doing a lot of kind of demo stuff. And uh, you know, it was an interesting meeting. Uh, you know, the conclusion of that meeting was basically, yeah, so our pitch to him was, you basically need to dump x86 and go Java. <laughs> we were kind of ambitious at the time. Uh, and ultimately, that never happened. You know, ultimately, we, he, he just said, all right, we're, we're going to make it run really well on Intel, so don't worry. But we didn't get what we wanted. I had another experience where I was talking. So what happened eventually is the Java Products Group on Hamilton Avenue in Palo Alto, eventually all, it, we ran out of space, so we eventually moved to form JavaSoft and Cupertino on De Anza. And so we were all sitting around one day and we were saying, who could benefit from software that you write once and then you run on other platforms? And we looked across the street and there was Apple. Right? So we basically held a bunch of Java days inside of Apple. And one of the amazing things that happened was, was we came into Apple and we were like, you guys should do Java. And so they said, all right. <clears throat> so the first place that they pointed us to was the Dillon Group, because they said, well, so there was a thing called the Newton at the time. And the Newton was programmed by this language called Dillon, right? dynamic language. And so because of the Dillon language, we ended up talking to those guys. Right? So the next guy, so the Dillon guy said, well, this isn't really a language. It's actually an object framework. So you need to talk to the intelligent guys. <laughs> so we talked to the intelligent guys, and they were like, this isn't an object framework. This is really uh, some kind of VM. So you need to talk to the PowerPC VM guys. So we talked to those guys. And those guys were like, well, you know, this isn't really a VM play. You know, this is more like a graphics and multimedia play on the internet. So you need to talk to the Kaleida team. Right? So the thing that was really interesting was, was we ended up ping-ponging all throughout the company and never getting any traction. Because every single piece of Apple was inventing some fragment of Java. And because of the kind of intensive secrecy within Apple, none of the groups actually talked to each other. And so Apple was in this very strange configuration. Uh, so I ended up talking with this guy, who was the original Apple evangelist, Guy Kawasaki. And he said to me over sushi, uh, he said, Java will never work because you can't beat Microsoft. <laughs> Right. So, I don't know, that was his advice. Interesting. So ultimately, we ended up building up this Java 1 program. 14,000 developers uh, sitting in a single giant hallway in Moscone. Maybe some in the spillover room. So, pretty exciting times, very heady times. I ran uh, 14 demos over three days, some really nail-biting demos, like uh, things where uh, I was demoing an IDE, and the guy who built the IDE was like recompiling the whole thing as people were coming into the room. <laughs> I was like, oh my, <laughs> that was a nightmare. It went off. Uh, we had this one demo, which was Java interfaces for telemetry on like the space shuttle. And this is really interesting, because like, what happened was was that we put it up on the big screen, and it was and it was funny because all the signals were completely flatlined. There's nothing going on. It was all these amazing looking graphics, and nothing was happening, right? And so everyone's kind of looking at the screen, and they're like, "What is this? This isn't good. You know, this is very depressing." And all of a sudden, boom! Like you see this curves going up, and you see all these numbers lighting up, and then the guy who was from uh, NASA, who was demoing, he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's the shuttle coming out of the shadow of the Earth and charging the solar panels. And the crowd just went nuts. You know? So it was definitely like another like, hold your breath moment in demo land. Um, we did this other thing. Uh, I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, we did this other demo, which was kind of fun. 
which was this Java Ring demo. And this was really interesting. We I don't know if anyone remembers this. Back in the Java 1 days, there was this Java Ring thing. So inside of that ring is a microprocessor that can run Java instruction language. And so what we had was we had these little ring docking stations all over Java 1. So we had 14,000 processor parallel computer. And we interconnected all these processors through this thing called the Java space. And it's really funny to think about how retro this was because I remember at the time we, we had a Spark station that had uh, five gigs of RAM, right? And that was kind of used to kind of create this Java space that, that synchronized all these computers into basically building a fractal image, right? Uh, but the thing that was funny about it was, is at the time, you know, five gigs of RAM was, was a lot. Um, obviously, again, kind of retro and showing, showing my age. But, um, you know, very futuristic and, and fun times. Uh, so this is when I ended up kind of, eventually, I, I, saw, I started working with, with Bill Joy on this project called Genie, which is related to all these distributed Java objects and everything. But Genie never ended up really taking off. And this is where I kind of jumped ship from Sun. Uh, this, this picture is funny. It's a bungee jumping Java mascot, the Duke guy. Uh, it turns out that I actually did this. I don't have a real picture of it. But I had an extra suit, Java suit, that was given to me by the people in, in Italy, the Milan Java team, Italian Java team. And so I went bungee jumping with this suit on. But this is what I did eventually. You know, I ended up leaving Sun at the time. So to, to make a long story short, you know, I ended up going into web services, and I ended up having that company and Infravio company acquired by Web Methods, Web Methods acquired by Software AG. So I found myself sitting in a 40-year-old German software company, which is kind of an incredible thing, experience for me. Uh, but you know, I'm going to kind of fly through this section. Uh, I ended up in the belly of uh, SOA. Service-oriented architecture. So I ended up writing this book called SOA Adoption for Dummies. Um, and uh, you know, I kind of compare the project of SOA with the project of achieving stability in Afghanistan, <laughs> which is it's kind of a super complex nightmare. But one of the magic and good things that came out of hanging out at Software AG is I got to meet one of my all-time heroes. I got to hang out with Steve Wozniak, who is one of the founders of Apple. And he taught me a really amazing thing about platforms, which is he said that his main job at Apple initially was to reduce the number of chips. So he said one of the first contracts that he got was with Steve Jobs was to create a game, which is a single player version of Pong, which ended up being this game called Breakout. And he said that he was able to reduce the number of chips for that game down to like 40 chips, which is, seems like a large number of chips. But that's what it was like back then. But the thing that was exciting about what I learned from Steve Wozniak is, is that platforms are not about variation. They're about conservation. And the fact that this super innovative guy was so obsessed with reducing the number of chips, what that means is it's about reducing to the common core, the least common denominator of what it takes. Because what happened when you reduced the number of chips is you made the cost, manufacturing cost of this possible, and then you could drive a revolutionary number of PCs. So anyhow, so you know, the kind of punchline about platforms is, is you know, I learned ultimately that platforms are this substrate. And that what your goal is for a platform is, is to create something that's very conserved. It's the smallest and most compact possible expression of what people need to use. And that that kind of conservation creates an enablement of variation, right? Which is you have these lovely interfaces, you have this compact expression, and then on top of that, everyone can go crazy and build whatever it is that they want. So I think that was kind of my big take home lesson. So, you know, I think I'm out of time to talk about uh, where I'm doing now, which is mobile 
developer cloud stuff. But you know, if you do have an interest, uh, feel free to check it out, kii.com. Developer portal is at developer.key.com, so please do make an effort. Uh, you know, if, you, if you have any questions, comments, or you just want to connect, feel free to find me on LinkedIn or send me an email, and I'd be glad to uh, converse with, with you guys. So thank you very much.